This is Mike of Live and Good, and uh, I am sitting here in our flat in Lower Hutt, New Zealand, and I have in front of me the book The Wow Factor. Today I thought I would read uh, with you chapter number six, Living Outside of Our Comfort Zone. Uh, passage of scripture that I base this chapter on is chapter number two of 1 John and verse 27, but his anointing teaches you all things and John 5 and 39, search the scripture. Living in revival is one of the greatest privileges a person can have given to them. It can also be one of the most challenging things a person can ever face. I believe pastoring a revival is God's goal for every pastor, but it can also be an incredibly challenging thing. I sat with a denominational executive during the revival of the 1990s who told me he was receiving the most incredible stories in his nearly 30 years in his office. Churches were experiencing the greatest moves of God they had ever known. It was wonderful. However, not every phone call brought reports of glory. Some pastors describe the white water ride of revival to be a bit more than they have bargained for. In the little book by James Byrne that I mentioned in a previous chapter, he outlined not only the conditions preceding revival, but also the events that follow revival. Two of those events were phenomena and opposition. It seems God refuses to live inside the boxes we construct for him. Every church has a box. Every church has an ethos and a code of conduct they expect God to maintain. I do not mean to insult anyone with the following illustration, but if you bear with me, I believe you'll understand the point I'm trying to make. When God goes to a what is called a high church, he is expected to behave in a particular manner. The outline of the service is usually placed in our corporate hands. We know when to stand, to sit, to pray, to repeat, to listen. I was praying with a pastor from such a church who suddenly cried out, Oh God, please, do something that is not in the bulletin. If I leave this type of church and go to what is considered a more mainline or evangelical church, I may discover a bit more informality. The air may be punctuated with more amens, and the clapping of hands during the singing of songs is more accepted than in the high church. However, there are still guidelines. The meeting is certainly led from the front, and God is expected to refrain from placing a prophetic word in the heart of a worshiper. And by all means, he should never prompt someone to pray aloud in tongues. If we go down the street to the Pentecost or charismatic church, we may notice it is more freewheeling, lifting of the hands as they worship is likely to be more common. But utterance in tongues does not strike great uncertainty into the heart of those familiar with Pentecostal worship norms. God is permitted to do that, but there will still be restraints on what is acceptable and what is not. Still, some things are met with resistance. Let me illustrate. A Bible college president of my acquaintance was speaking to a nationwide gathering of the state leaders of his group. In his message, he addressed the comfort zones or ways we expect God to conduct himself in our churches. When he spoke of clapping hands and lifting holy hands before the Lord, the leaders were with him. But then he suggested they practice another biblical expression of worship. He suggested they dance before the Lord, observing that the Bible contained more references to that expression than to clapping, after which he had them all stand and position themselves far enough apart so they could dance. 
They were quite relieved when instead of insisting on the dance, he allowed them to return to their seats. All recognized dancing was in the Bible, but it was not within their comfort zones. Some were prepared to stretch themselves, while others suggested he was a wise man who knew when it was time to stop. What do you do when revival moves outside the box? What do you do? when God appears to be interested in stretching your comfort zones. In the revival of the last decade of the 20th century, pastors indicated to me their shock at the discovery of comfort zones they had not known existed. Some were comfort zones within their congregations. Some were comfort zones within their hearts. More than one pastor told me he was stunned at those in his church who rejected revival when it came. They had been praying for many years for God to send revival. But when it came, God did not package it in the way he had packaged previous moves. Because it was outside of their box, some simply could not accept it. They had an image of what revival needed to look like. And when the present one did not conform, they convinced themselves this could not be God. Often the struggle over revival has been with phenomena, such as people falling on the floor or shaking. Sometimes it has been the occurrence of dreams or visions. At other times the issue has been the intrusion of the gifts of the Spirit or healing miracles breaking into the flow of the meetings. Perhaps less dramatic, but often more problematic, has been the introduction of different expressions of worship. So what are you to do when God appears to be operating outside of the box? Does revival require us to embrace every new and strange thing as coming straight from the throne of God? Should we set up revival police who investigate and evaluate everything to determine whether we embrace it or reject it? Let me begin by simply observing revival will probably stretch you. God will occasionally go outside of your box. As for me personally, he seems to have enjoyed destroying boxes that I had created for him. Revival will take you there. Two extremes must be noted. Some will embrace everything that comes along during a revival, and others will reject everything that is new to them. Some will not only go where no man has ever gone, but they will also go where no angel has ever been or intends to go. Others will be so entrenched in their position that no amount of dynamite will move them. Those pastors who are reading this book will probably have three desires. You want to please God. You want to see your church grow and thereby see the kingdom grow. And you want to see your people minister to. So what are the principles to consider as a spiritual leader? I want to consider five safeguards when deciding if this is God stepping you outside your comfort zone. Then I want to consider three ways to avoid being trapped by the counterfeit. Can you show me that in Scripture? We were ministering in what became a six-week revival in a church in the eastern part of the United States. I had received a phone call just minutes before the service from our personal intercessors, and this caused me to be a, a bit late entering the auditorium. As I stepped through the door, the entire church was standing on their feet, clapping. No one was at the podium, and they did not appear to be responding to human direction. I found my place and began to join them. It soon became apparent they were clapping unto the Lord. After several minutes of sustained clapping, I asked the Lord, 
what was going on? In my spirit, I heard him say, this is a Psalm 47 service. So I opened my Bible to that portion of scripture. The opening line in the King James says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. The next line reads, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Just as I was reading this phrase, the congregation broke into spontaneous shouts of worship to the Lord. Thinking to myself, this is interesting, I continued to read the psalm. Verse 3 says, He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. As I was reading that line, the entire congregation broke into dancing or jumping before the Lord. Verse 5 begins with, God is gone up with a shout. Sure enough, after a few minutes of exuberant dancing, the congregation again lifted the rafters with shouts. By now, I was fully engaged with the chapter. The next line in verse 5 reads, The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. I said to the Lord, I've got you there because I'm the only trumpet player in this auditorium and I do not have my trumpet with me. Just as I was saying this to the Lord, the man on the keyboard, whom I had judged as being fairly carnal, pushed a few buttons on the keyboard and began to only play one key at a time. And yes, you guessed it, the sound coming from the keyboard was that of a trumpet. I turned to the pastor who was standing next to me and told him, I know what is going to happen next. I showed him the flow of the scripture and he saw how it related to the pattern of the service. I said the next thing that should happen, according to verse 6, is singing. Because that verse reads, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our King, sing praises. As we were looking at that verse, the entire congregation, roughly 135 that morning, broke into the same song. Now, all of this happened with no one standing at the podium giving directions to the meeting. It was a morning where it appeared God did church the way he wanted to do it. The purpose of telling this story is to emphasize the role of scripture. When the service took on a flow that was not the normal pattern, God took me to a passage of scripture that explained what he was doing at that moment. Revival will have those moments that are not ordinary. In those moments, there will be a, a balance and support between scripture and spirit. Normally the scripture, which is the foundation of all we do, will support or explain the activity of the spirit. The spirit will never give direction contrary to the scripture. However, there are times when the Spirit will give a better understanding of what is in the Scriptures. Here's an example. The prophet Joel had been, had been read many times before the day of Pentecost. But on that day, the Holy Spirit gave Peter a fresh understanding of God's Word. The passage had always been there. Religious leaders had probably spoken from the passage or at least discussed and debated it. But on that day, the Spirit gave Peter an application beyond what any could have dreamed. It was not a teaching contrary to God's Word, but it gave an understanding that had not been grasped before. Not only did the apostles make constant reference to Old Testament passages, and it showed how they were fulfilled in Jesus. And I bring you to your attention, Acts 3, 22 and 23, Acts 4, 25 and 26, uh, Acts 8, 30 through 35, which is Philip the Evangelist, and then Acts 13, 32 to 42. But it also, uh, the apostles also gave the combination of the Spirit acting with or on the Word. And this gave them the understanding as to what they were to do. 
In Acts 13, 45, the Jews rejected the message preached by Paul and Barnabas. So they turned to the Gentiles and proclaimed God's good news to them. This turning to the Gentiles was not only based on the rejection by the Jews, but in Acts 13, 47, by a revelation or understanding of Isaiah 49, 6. This same pattern is seen in the gathering of the church leaders in Acts 15, where they came together to evaluate this expansion into the Gentile world. The revelation by the Spirit to Peter on the rooftop in Acts 10, which had sent him to the house of Cornelius, now supported by the miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles through Paul and Barnabas, followed by a new understanding by James in Acts 15, 15 through 18 of Amos 9, 11 and 12, led to the embracing of the Gentiles as brothers in Christ. The Spirit gave them a proper understanding or application of God's Word. Indeed, one could argue much of the writings of the Apostle Paul are a revelation by the Spirit of Old Testament principles that have only been partially understood. I am not proposing an open canon, but I am saying during seasons of revival, the Holy Spirit will often give an application from a passage of Scripture to a situation. Let me say again that I believe the Scripture is our final plumb line. However, sometimes the Spirit explains the Scripture without violating the bounds of proper biblical exegesis. At other times, the Scripture explains the activity of the Spirit. Does it violate Scripture? Perhaps another way to explain this concept is to ask, does this impression or apparent activity of the Spirit violate Scripture? Is there either plain Scripture that indicates this activity of the Spirit is wrong? Or does this so-called activity of the Spirit violate the principles of Scripture? When I am evaluating a possible leading of the Spirit during a service, I look for plain Scripture from the Lord. If that is not there, I ask myself, does this leading run contrary to the nature of Scripture? The great Apostle John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, closes the gospel bearing his name with these words. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written everyone, I suppose, that even the world itself cannot contain the books that should be written. Hebrews 2, 3, and 4 tells us the message of salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. The principle I am trying to explain is the scripture is not a straitjacket. But we need to be careful here. John says Jesus did many things that were not recorded in scripture. The writer of Hebrews indicates it was the combination of the spoken message and the signs and wonders which served as confirmation. I do not necessarily need chapter and verse to tell me a particular action is acceptable. However, that action will never violate the spirit of the scripture. Let me illustrate. Revival is often preceded by and nurtured by intercession. My wife has led groups of intercessors. She and I together have led scores, if not hundreds of prayer meetings over the years. Sometimes an intercessor will be led by the Spirit to do a prophetic act or a Spirit-led illustration. During a prayer meeting which occurred in a 15-week revival, 
I was strongly impressed. There would be people in the meetings that week who were in bondage to sin. At a sense, it was like they were trapped behind a gate or fence and that we needed to open the gate so they could be released to come to the altar. I asked the prayer warriors to stand at the end of each row of seats and in the name of Jesus to open an invisible gate and allow the sinners to come through the gate to the altar. My mind and spirit were drawn to Isaiah 45, 1 through 3, which reads in the King James, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, and the God of Israel. I understood contextually that this was a word that God was going to use Cyrus to restore the Jewish people from bondage. God was going to go before Cyrus and would favor him with wealth and power. I did not feel it violated the spirit of the passage to ask God to open the gates or break in pieces those things holding the sinners captive that week and allow them to experience the treasures of his kingdom. It became a great week of people getting saved. On the other hand, I am aware people may abuse this application of scripture. Intimacy can be an important part of intercession. I have been told of some who felt they needed to illustrate God's desire for spiritual intimacy with his people by engaging in sexual activity. Such activity is a clear violation of thou shalt not commit adultery. And it is something the Spirit of God would never, and I underscore never do. I do not care how many angels danced on the head of the pen. If what they told you to do is contrary to Scripture, do not do it. Does your spirit bear witness? Not every thought that crosses my mind comes from God. I have to sort out the source of the thought. Did it come from my own, often very active mind? Did it come from something someone said to me earlier? Did it come from an evil spirit? Did it come from the Lord? We are given a wonderful promise in 1 John 2, 27. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him we have been given an anointing from him and that anointing will teach us learn to listen to that anointing that is inside you this anointing is not the same thing as your mind proverbs 20 27 describes the spirit of man as the candle of the lord there is a quiet voice that will speak to us from deep inside it is where the Spirit of the Lord lives. Learn to pay attention to that voice. Never violate it. Sometimes this witness is also buttressed by your personal experience. Let me illustrate what I'm saying. During a month-long revival in southern Illinois, I had an encounter with the travailing part of intercession. The pastor called for a day of fasting and prayer. While we were praying together over the lunch hour, I found myself in a fetal position in a side aisle weeping. 
I felt such a strong internal pain and burden for souls. I do not remember how long I wept, but I did so until the burden lifted. It did that just as suddenly as it had come. The following Sunday saw the greatest response to salvation during the entirety of that month. That burden never came on me in quite the same way again. However, my wife began to experience this type of a spirit of travail. My personal experience and witness assured me and her she was not losing her mind. A number of years ago, we were on the final night of meetings in the state of Arkansas. The altar service was winding down and I was sitting on the floor at the rear of the platform or stage area. I decided to go to the pulpit and close the meeting when a man at the rear of the auditorium began to drone in tongues. After listening a few moments, I decided to shut him down and close the meeting. Immediately, a very strong sense came into my spirit not to do so. I felt very strongly I was not to touch what was happening. At least twice, I started to get to my feet to stop the droning. And both times, that same very strong witness came into my spirit. About this time, the 16-year-old son of the pastor came to me. He felt God had given him a word to say, perhaps an interpretation. Once again, that very strong inner witness indicated I should give him the microphone. So I did. I do not recall what he said, but as he was speaking, people began to return to the altars. Much weeping broke out. Ultimately, the one-week meeting became a two-week meeting and possibly a precursor to a later very strong move of God that church experienced. Had I listened to my mind instead of my spirit, I would have silenced the droner and we would have missed what God wanted to do. And then I asked, what is the fruit? Connected to the witness of the Holy Spirit with your spirit is a very simple truth. When God is in something, it will bear fruit. A bit of trial and error may occur here as we learn to listen to the voice of the Spirit speaking to our spirit. But the ultimate test of an impression or a manifestation is found in the fruit it produces. Many struggle with some manifestations that occur in a revival. I wrote a small book entitled, What Happens During Revival, where I deal in some detail regarding those various manifestations. I would like to take three quotes from the book. I quote David Womack in the Wellsprings of the Pentecostal Movement on page 79. Quote, the emotional pitch of the revival was high and many physical manifestations were seen. This brought much opposition to the meetings, but the preachers saw in these emotional outbreaks the results of the conviction of sin and effects of the experience of salvation in their hearers." End quote. Another quote comes from the ministry of Lorenzo Dow, a Methodist evangelist. When the manifestation of being slain in the Spirit occurred in his meetings, some supposed it was strictly flesh, while others thought it was the work of the devil. And Dow responded to the latter by saying, quote, If it be the devil's work, they will use the dialect of hell when they come to. End quote. This quote came from James Gilchrist Lawson in Deeper Experiences by Famous Christians on page 163. During the Brownsville revival at the close of this past century, the leaders of that revival asked themselves five questions regarding manifestations. John Kilpatrick records them on pages 99 to 100 in Feast of Fire, which I also quote in my small book. Number one, is Jesus being lifted up? Number two, 
Is this creating a greater hunger for God and His Word? Number three, is this leading people to love God and each other more? Number four, is this bringing truth and greater spiritual depth? And number five, is there any practical change taking place? Now, sometimes this must be judged over time. In other words, Pastor Kilpatrick was asking, what is the fruit? According to Jesus in Matthew 7, 15 to 20, the fruit tells us the source. Fruit is not, do I like it? Rather, it includes the list above. Are they falling more in love with Jesus? Are they becoming more like him? Has their hunger for him increased as a result? One of the more unusual services I ever experienced occurred while I was serving as a pastor. We were in a series of meetings with an evangelist and guest musicians. At one point, the evangelist left his seat next to me, ran to the front of the stage, grabbed the hand of the lead female singer, and began skipping around the auditorium. Well, I sat there thinking, that's strange. Two of my more conservative deacons left their seats in the auditorium to run to the stage, take the hands of two more members of the same team, and join in the skipping. I suddenly found myself with a very strong urge to join them. And so I jumped up, grasped the hand of a male singer, and pursued the other three couples. I think we skipped around the auditorium twice. Seven of the eight skippers were rejoicing in the Lord. One was praying the media would not enter our auditorium. Uh, that would have been me. We finished skipping by standing at the altar worshiping. Nobody else budged. At the close of the service, the leaders of that group sat down with me to share what was happening from their perspective. That group was composed of seven members. Four of the seven were even then facing the deepest crisis of their ministry. Would you like to venture a guess on which four? I cannot explain why or how it worked, but somewhere in that skipping, God broke through into their lives and what could have destroyed them did not do so. Now, I am not telling you this to announce a new skipping doctrine. In fact, I have never done that since, although I will, if so instructed by the Lord. The point is simply that the fruit of the unusual manifestation verified it was from the Lord. I have learned to be slower to pronounce Ichabod over something I do not understand, but give it time to see if God is indeed in it. And then what do others think? God has given us several ways to determine if an action is His or not. If there is no clear indication from Scripture, if your sense is not clear either, God has given you the body of Christ. What is the witness of others you trust? Not everyone who speaks to a situation should. Not long ago, a revival broke open at a church in New Zealand. I was asked by someone not connected to that revival if I would be willing to speak into it. My response was, it would be inappropriate for me to speak into what I had not been invited to speak into. However, if the leader of that revival was interested in my input, I would be willing to talk with him. I am amazed or amused at the people who are willing to speak into situations they know nothing about. A friend in the States who saw a significant revival come to his church told me he received numerous phone calls suggesting the revival be moved from his place to their place for various reasons. Sometimes, you have to protect yourself from what others are saying. Having said that, the scripture still teaches safety 
can be found in a multitude of counselors. In Proverbs 11 and 14, I am not so egotistical as to think I am the only one who can hear from God. How does that work out in a revival type of service? I may have an impression, but I am not in charge of the meeting. I either wait until the meeting is given to me to proceed with what I sense, or I take the leader aside and share what I am sensing and ask how that sits with what he or she is sensing. If it is in the spirit, agreement will come. If the agreement is not there, I do not go any further with it. Sometimes the service is in my hands, but I have some question about what I feel we should do. I will either talk to the leader of the meeting, who is usually the pastor of the church, or I may converse with my wife. Since August of 2010, I have been connected to an outpouring taking place in the state of Indiana. I began as the lead evangelist. Other voices now speak into the outpouring but I suppose I am still considered a key voice. From early days, we would convene a holy huddle on the stage or the front row, depending where we were sitting. The huddle would often consist of a pastor who is apostolic, a recognized prophet, and myself. A visiting missionary spoke to me of the safety she felt watching us in the huddle. We were checking out what we sensed with each other. Often the prophets in that outpouring are quick to run prophetic words past me before they share them in public. When God began speaking prophetic type words to my wife for a meeting, she would first come to me and share what she felt. She was prepared to submit her sense to my wisdom. She still does that. In the early days, I would often share a direction for the service she had felt without identifying her as the source. Now, I am more likely to hand her the microphone. I am not afraid to confirm the leading I have with those I trust. But what about the counterfeits? Some are so afraid of counterfeits, they refuse to embrace the genuine. Yes. There are false prophets. Yes, there are overly enthusiastic people who will miss God. No, you are not perfect. And you will make mistakes from time to time. Relax. God is not about to fall off of His throne. You do not deal with counterfeit cash by throwing out the good stuff. Bank tellers are taught to recognize the counterfeit by handling the authentic. The more you are exposed to authentic moves of God, the more rapidly you will recognize both that which is genuine and that which is not. Hang out with revival leaders. Attend services where it is happening. Watch how the leaders deal with the situations. I practiced this during the Browns of Revival. I went to receive from the Lord but I also went to learn. I watched Steve Hill preach and give altar calls. I watched John Kilpatrick give oversight to the meeting. I spent time with Kerry Robertson, the senior associate. In fact, I developed a hotline to Kerry's desk. We had a preacher who was powerfully impacted by the outpouring in Terre Haute, Indiana. Later, he became the evangelist at a six-month revival. He told me, when confronted with situations in the service where he did not know what to do, he would ask himself, what have I seen Michael do in these situations? Learn from the authentic, and you will not often be caught up by that which is not. To avoid the counterfeit, spend a great deal of time in the Word of God. Live in it. This means more than knowing a few random verses. The more you spend time in the Word, the more you'll come to understand the nature of God and how He operates. 
you'll not only come to know chapter and verse, but you'll also come to know the spirit of the words. A lady who was upset with people falling to the ground during a meeting I was preaching challenged it by saying to me, my God does not do that. But the reality is that the God of the Bible did do that. I can take her to 20-some passages of Scripture where he did. I could take her to the pages of history to show her where he did do that. The question was not, does God do that? But rather, was this particular moment from God? My final suggestion for dealing with the counterfeit is to spend much time praying in the Spirit. You will come to recognize Him. Jesus told a group of religious leaders they were in error because they did not know the Word nor the power of God. That's in Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. We need to know the Scripture. We also need to know the power of God. Many are powerful in the Word, but they still are weak in the power or the Spirit. It is both Spirit and truth. In his conversation with a Samaritan woman, Jesus stressed this combination. That's in John 4, 23 and 24. It takes two wings for a bird to fly. The more you pray in the Spirit, the more you will come to know Him. Did you ever receive a phone call before the days of caller ID where the voice on the other end asked the question, do you know who this is? You stalled as long as you could. You tried to come up with a name, but finally had to admit you did not know your caller. Once they identified themselves, you knew them. Why did you not know them before? Because it was not a voice you heard frequently. My wife never identifies herself to me on the phone. She just begins, hey, honey. There are many people called honey, but I know immediately who she is. Why? Because I spend a lot of time with her. I know her voice. Some years ago, my secretary was told I believed a certain thing. She responded by saying to the person, I will categorically deny he said that or believes that. She went on to say, I know him. And I know he does not think that way. Now I have no idea what I was supposed to have believed or spoken. One who knew me knew it was not so. I encourage you, Spend much time praying in the Spirit and hanging out with Him. You will come to know how He thinks, feels, and acts. The counterfeit will not impress you. Well, I have been reading from my new book, The Wow Factor, More Adventures in Revival. And you can get this book uh, several ways. You can uh, go to our website, uh, either MikeLivingGoodMinistries.com or doorkeepersnewzealand.org. Uh, and on both websites, there's a place there where it says uh, uh, the wow factor, and you can uh, touch that place. You can connect there, and it will take you to a page that will tell you how you can place the order and uh, the required cost, and we'll be glad to ship the book to you. Or you can also order this book on Amazon, and they will send it to you. Or thirdly, you can drop us a, a letter and, and request the book, and we'll be glad to send you this particular book. We want it to be a blessing to you. Here's an idea, and maybe the some that are watching this uh, would love to get a book and give it to a pastor friend as a gift uh, or another friend in ministry. Maybe some of you have a child who's preparing to enter ministry, and they may find this book to be a great resource to them and you can bless them by obtaining it for them. Well, I look forward to gathering together with you again in just a few days to read the next chapter of the book, The Wow Factor. And we're going to move to another section of the book. And this next section, we're going to begin a series of case studies where I will actually analyze revivals that I am familiar with 
And I believe you will find that part of the reading to be fascinating. So I want to encourage you to pay attention to when we go on, whether you're watching this through Facebook or you're watching this on the YouTube. Uh, I look forward to sharing with you again very soon. God bless you.